Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. Happy Sunday, uh, happy parents weekend, great game yesterday. Um, hey, yeah, Nathan said this in the beginning and I just want to emphasize it. We want this place to feel like home. Um, there's coffee and donuts like you mentioned and there's also Bibles in the, in the back of the room. Um, I would love it if you, if you grabbed a copy, um, if you don't have one so you can follow with me uh, through the chapter. Um, and also, if you found your way to college without a Bible, that is our gift to you. Um, I have learned time and time again that my life is transformed by God's word. Um, and so I would love to, um, to give you a copy. Um, so yeah, that's kind of um, who I am. Like Nathan said, my name is Zach. Uh, I'm on PAC staff. PAC, the PAC is awesome. Would love to talk with uh, anyone who has any questions about that. Um, and I'm super excited to be up here this morning. Um, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 12. Um, like Nathan mentioned, we're going through the whole story of Samuel. Uh, and before we dive into the text, I wanted to share uh, a personal story just from my life. So graduated TCU about two and a half years ago. Um, and before I went to TCU, I actually did my freshman year at Purdue University in Indiana. Um, and transferring is, is a really big part of my story to see how the Lord showed up in, in transferring and, and what he did was awesome. But for the sake of, of this story, Purdue was my stereotypical college experience. Um, so when I was in high school, I, I probably went to two or three church events a week um, and I led a Sunday school on Sunday mornings, and I also led a, a Wednesday night youth group, right? Maybe this sounds familiar to you, but when I went to college, that support system, that structure of accountability uh, was all gone. There was no one who really knew me anymore, right? And so um, no one was holding me accountable. And so I found a group of friends probably a week into, into class um, in the, just in my dorm room, um, and we started going out on the weekends and partying. Um, and at Purdue, there was not really like West 7th or, or the stockyards or anything like that. It was all house parties. Um, and so that's where our story starts. We are walking up to a house party one weekend. Um, and then the way the house is built, it's built on a, a hill. So the front, uh, the front door is locked. And the only way to get into the party, you have to go through the back and up the back deck um, and kind of just into the backyard uh, or through the backyard. And so we go, we go up there and, and we're having a good time for a while. Um, and I, I can't remember, I think we were going to maybe another party, but we started, we decided to head out. And um, I can, I can picture this so clearly. I'm the last one in, in my group to leave and, I, and they're kind of a bit ahead of me. And so I head down the back deck and I cross the backyard and I start to feel this, this wet stuff on my head and on my back. Um, I look up, terrible, <laughs> terrible idea. Guys, I got peed on. <laughs> um, yeah, I was crossing the backyard uh, and someone was peeing off the back deck straight onto me. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny now, right? I can laugh at it. But back then, that ruined, that ruined my night. So I leave my group. I'm, I'm heading back to the freshman dorm. And it's like a 20-minute walk from this, from this house to my freshman dorm. And that walk, right, it's just me and my thoughts. And all these thoughts are just in my head. And, and these memories come flooding back and these thoughts. And, and then I get into, um, you know, my freshman dorm and I'm rinsing the pee <laughs> out of my hair, right? And these thoughts and these memories won't go away. And I think the thing that I can remember thinking most is like, what am I doing, right? What am I doing? How did I get here? I can remember so clearly the words of my youth pastor when I was a senior in high school. He said only 30% of high school students keep their faith in college. And back then, I promised myself that I would be a part of the 30%. But it seemed like when I got to college, I put my life on autopilot and I look up and I, 
and I'm just completely so far from God. I, I gave up these, this good life, these good habits, a, a full life with him, and I exchanged it. I chose to, to pursue this new and shiny thing instead. How did I get here? What am I doing? How do I get back from this? That's where our text is going to meet us today. This was the first time in, in my life that I fully realized how much we are prone to wander. And in our passage, the Israelites are met with the same conviction and the same realization. We are all prone to wander from a God who is better, and we can suddenly be made aware of how far we've drifted and how easily we can go off track. They were asking the same questions I was asking. How did, I, how did we get here, right? How do we come back from this? And, and hopefully by the end of our time together, we'll see how. Uh, I feel like I'm always able to track easier if I know where we're going, um, and so I just wanted to give you guys an overview. We're going to start in the text, and we're going to work through the text, um, and we're going to pull out um, some truths from the text, and then we'll end on some application. Um, so yeah, before we jump in, uh, I also wanted to give some context. Um, so we've been going through the book of Samuel, for Samuel, um, and if you've been with us, there are, there are two key players in the story of First Samuel so far. Um, the first is Samuel. Um, He's the, the guy that the book is named after, actually. And a couple of things you should know about Samuel. Uh, first, he is the first prophet. Um, and what that means, we read this a couple chapters ago. Um, the t- first time that God is calling Samuel, he's actually speaking to him. And Samuel thinks that it's someone else in, in, in like a different room calling, him out, calling out to him. Um, and so what we can see from that is Samuel literally heard from the Lord. And... Also, what this means is that whatever is happening through Samuel is because it's God's will, right? God is instructing through Samuel the people. Okay, second thing you should know about Samuel is not only is he the first prophet, he's also the last judge. Um, The way that the nation of Israel had been interacting with God up until this point um, and that kind of their power structure was through judges. Um, And now... The people have demanded a king, and, and we'll get into that. That's in the text. But the people have demanded a king, and so Saul um, is, the, is the king that God has kind of raised up. And so Samuel is, is raising up Saul, um, and he will be the king over the people. And, and if you see, the, the heading of 1 Samuel 12 is Samuel's farewell address. Um, and that's not to mean that Samuel's going anywhere, necessarily, um, Samuel will actually be a key player in in the chapters ahead. But what it does mean is that it's this change of power, right? Samuel is stepping down and Saul will be stepping in as king. And it's this change of power that chapter 12 is all about. It's almost like a a commencement speech, right, in the nation of Israel as they're turning from one chapter of their nation to the next. Um, So yeah, the text breaks up into a a few clean parts and just want to read the first one together. This is verses 1 through 5. And Samuel said to all of Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray. And behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am, testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. And at this moment, you can almost picture it, right? Absolute silence from the people. They said, You have not defrauded us, or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. Samuel is laying the foundation by reminding the people that he has done everything justly and that whatever happens next is not because of his leadership, right? And I think it might be really easy and really catchy to just summarize this section as don't blame me. That, I mean, that's certainly what I did as I was studying this, this passage for the first time, right? Samuel's saying, don't blame me. But remember, Samuel is a prophet of the Lord. And I think that if we leave it there, um, of just saying, don't blame me, we're missing the bigger picture. Because Samuel is is a mouthpiece of the Lord, what he's really saying to the Israelites is, um, has God done anything to make you reject him, right? 
he's asking the people if in rejecting him, they're rejecting God and, and why. Samuel is really making the argument that God is good, God is perfect, God is holy, and the people had no real reason to complain to him for a new leader, right? He's saying, you had a good thing, guys, and you're acknowledging that you had a good thing, right? There was no complaints, so why did you demand a king? Because as we'll see, in, the, in them demanding a king, they're telling God they don't want him to be king anymore. From his introduction, Samuel moves to the main focus of his speech. Um, this is a longer section, so stay with me. This is verses 6 through 15. And Samuel said to the people, The Lord is witness, who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the Lord. And the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God. And he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side. And you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your king. And now, behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. I want to put it on the screen for you to visualize, but we see two distinct points being made here. In the beginning, Samuel starts by summarizing the history of the nation of Israel, right? He, what he's really saying to them is, here's how you've been unfaithful in the past. And he highlights, right, you were in Egypt and you cried out and, he, and God saved you. But while, after he saved you, you turned away from him again. And then your enemies were around you and you cried out and he saved you, right? And now you're, you're um, turning away from him again, right? Samuel is showing them, here's how you've been unfaithful in the past by highlighting their history as a nation. And from here, as we've seen, he goes on to show the Israel, Israelites how their demanding of a king is just another step of their unfaithfulness to God, right? Here's how you've been, or how, here's how you're being unfaithful now. And I want to highlight this verse specifically. Um, if you mark up your Bible or underline it, I would definitely recommend underlining the back half of verse 12. All right, it says this, You said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. See, the Israelites have rejected the invisible, capital K, king of the universe in exchange for an earthly ruler. Samuel also makes it clear that in these verses, although the way that their power structure is changing, his standard for them has not changed. He says that if the king and the people would submit to God's will and God's design, then it will be well. Otherwise, the Lord will be against them. And this is purely speculation, right? This is not in the text itself. But I would want to make the argument that everything Samuel has said up until this point, the Israelites knew, right? They knew. They're the people of God. They knew who God was. They knew that he was a perfect leader. They knew that he was good, that he was for them, that he was holy. They knew. And they also knew, I would argue, that these steps that they're taking are just steps away from the Lord. And despite knowing all of this, right, there was no action behind their knowledge. The thoughts were in their minds but in no way had those 
that knowledge, those thoughts pierced, transformed, even entered their hearts, right? There, there was no reflection of them understanding. And this is why the next three verses uh, are in Samuel's speech. So let's read verses 16 through 18. Now therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. In my story, from the beginning, I was in the exact same place as the Israelites, right? I had grown up in church. I knew all the things about God. I could have answered, you know, a test. I could have taken the questions. But I get to college, and this new and enticing thing is introduced in my life, and I chose it despite knowing all of these things. The other thing that I want to say is that in the Bible, when you see a miracle, right, it's almost like a spiritual mic drop. The miracle is meant to authenticate the message. And it's telling us, like, whatever was just communicated is a big deal. And so, in the moment of this awesome thunderstorm, the people of Israel are jolted out of their passivity. Based on what I know from my experience, I can only imagine what it must have been like for them. And we see explicitly what their response is in in verse 19. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. You see, it was just like me, right? (laughs) I, just like the Israelites, right? Almost poetically, I got rained on. And and that just shocked me. (laughs) Yeah, it shocked me out of passivity, right? But it was the same thing for them. This event completely cracks their reality. They thought it was one way and then this thing happens and God's power is displayed to them and they completely turn. Their response is literally, we are so guilty of this. Pray for us so that we don't die. And that is a really, really discouraging place to be in. I don't know if you're like me, but like I've said before, it's really easy for me to just put my life on cruise control for a week or two weeks or even longer, right? And suddenly, I look up and I look around and I can't believe the things that are controlling my life, the things that are influencing my actions and my thoughts. I mean, it's absolutely what happened my freshman year, right? And in those moments, it's super easy for me to think, gosh, surely the Lord is done with me right? Surely the last time that I wandered, that was the last time God would forgive me. And now the only thing that's left is his wrath. It's exactly what the Israelites are saying, right? In verse 19, surely the Lord's forgiveness has run out. Please pray for us so we might not be struck. And hear me say this, God would have been just in executing that punishment. Please pray for us so that we are not struck down immediately for our disobedience. And here's where I want to take a step back and look at it from a personal perspective, right? Samuel's speech thus far has been, here's how you've been unfaithful in the past and here's how you're being unfaithful now to a good and perfect God. And like I said, when I go on cruise control or on autopilot, there are things that start to take control of my life that influence my thoughts and my actions And if I'm not aware of them, right, that's when I get into trouble. For me, for example, one of the things that I wrestle with is pride. Um, I think a while ago, I would have said that I know exactly how every single part of my life is supposed to go. I know best. I know how to control this area. I know what other people should be doing even, and they're doing it wrong, and I'm doing it right. The Lord has been kind to me and revealed that my life is not good when I'm at, on the throne. My life is not good when I'm in control. But that pride didn't go anywhere. Does that make sense? Like I am still a prideful human and that pride just gets expressed in different ways. Um, maybe it's, I have trouble asking for help. 
um, or I have trouble admitting that I'm wrong. And the reality is we all have these patterns, these tendencies that we're bent to one way or another. And if we don't stop and ask the Lord, you know, what is it? What am I guilty of in the past? And what am I guilty of now? If we don't take the time to stop and ask um, these things that we will just keep controlling our lives when we go on autopilot. The Israelites are made aware of this pattern of unfaithfulness to the God of the universe. And they are overwhelmed by fear of death as punishment that God would be just in executing. But that's not what happens. We're going to slow down here and and camp out on the last six verses uh, for the rest of our time. These last six verses um, are God's response to the people of Israel through his prophet Samuel. Um, and, And from God's response, I want to pull three truths from, from the passage. And, and by truths, I don't just mean observations, right? By truths, I mean things that are constant and unchanging despite the times that we live in or what's surrounding us. It's like God's character, right? God does not change. It's who he is. And these truths are still true for us today. So this is God's response through his prophet Samuel, starting in verse 20. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. That is is beautiful. Do not be afraid. After slamming the Israelites for 18 verses about their unfaithfulness, their habitual unfaithfulness, and their rejection of a perfect God, when they cry out in fear, the first four words are do not be afraid. Let's keep reading. Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will continue uh, to instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. The first truth that I want to pull from this passage is that God is building a people for himself. God is building a people for himself. This idea that God is building a people for himself is so much bigger than just what's going on in 1 Samuel 12. Right? What we see in 1 Samuel 12 is a shadow of what is going on in the whole Bible. We, as creatures, are prone to rebellion. Right? We are prone to rebellion. And God, as our creator, is faithful to us despite how we reject him constantly. And that has been true always. Right? Adam and Eve in the garden rejected the Lord and rebelled against him. And every human sense has also rejected God. We forget who God is. We forget what he calls us to. And we forget that a life without him, without him is a life spent chasing after these earthly things that do not satisfy. And this has always been true. The Bible calls this sin, and we also see that the consequences of sin are slavery and death. On our own, we are stuck in the same patterns, the same cycle, enslaved to the things of this world. It's like a disease we can't be cured of. And at the same time, it's an accusation against the Lord, saying that we know better than he does. But remember... God is building a people for himself. Read verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. I would argue, I would argue that we are so quick and so often put ourselves at the center of the story of the Bible, right? We think that we are at the center of the story of the Bible. And if that were true, the story of the Bible would be really short and really crappy, right? The whole story would be, we rebelled. But that is not the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is God redeems. In 
our brokenness, in our inadequacies, God intervenes. God redeems us, right? That is the beauty of the story of the Bible. God is building, redeeming, and restoring a people to be put back in right relationship with him. And that offer is on the table for every single person if they would turn and give their life to him, right? God is building, redeeming, and restoring a people to be in relationship with him because he's building a people for himself. The second truth I want to pull from this passage um, is not only are we unfaithful, but God knows it, right? God knows we are unfaithful. He already knows. And this seems so obvious, but it's so hard to believe and internalize. Verse, verse 20 says, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, right? There's no excuse. And God also knows, right? When I'm at my worst, I can really easily believe the lie that God didn't know what he was getting into when he died for me, right? <laughs> I can easily tell myself that God is surprised when I rebel, when I sin. I'm not sure if you've heard these two lines before, um, but I want to share them with you. They're powerful. Um, The first is this. When Jesus died on the cross, all of your sins were future sins. When Jesus died, all of your failures, all of your inadequacies, all of your shortcomings were in the future. And what I mean by that is that there's no time constraint to what sin is covered by death, Christ's death on the cross. It's not like Jesus died the, the day that you started college and the only things you're forgiven of is before that point, right? The Lord is outside of time and he knew exactly how much we rebel and how much we will continue to rebel and yet he chose death on a cross for us. So that's the first thing. Second thing I want to share with you is this. God doesn't learn anything about me when I sin, right? I, I am shocked sometimes at the amount of wickedness that comes out of me, right? I, I do things, I say things, and I can't believe what comes out of me and, and the wickedness. God doesn't learn anything new about me right? It doesn't matter how far I've gone, how long I've turned away from him. He knows. He knows. And so that's, those two things just show us, gosh, God knows we're already unfaithful. And and that is a comfort, as crazy as that sounds. It is comforting to know that he already knows, right? Looking back at the story of 1 Samuel 12, God knew how rebellious the people of Israel were and he called them back still. And he knew that in the future they would rebel against him again. And he still called them back. And we can rest in the fact that God is calling us back to him despite our unfaithfulness because he knows. The third truth that I want to pull from this chapter is that not only does God not give up on us as we're unfaithful, but he's, he's gracious despite what we deserve. Uh, yeah, God is gracious enough not to measure our sins against us if we are in a relationship with him. If you remember, the, the wages, the cost of sin is death. And because we all sin, we all deserve death. But because of Christ's death on the cross, we are not bound by our sin anymore for those who would turn and follow him. Right, But it goes so much further than that. His, he is so gracious. Look at the examples in, in, in the story. God pulls the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt before giving them a single command. Right? He doesn't say, you have to do these things and then I will save you out of slavery. And in the same way, as they're surrounded by their enemies and they're worshiping false gods, the Lord doesn't say to them, you have to serve me now for the same amount of years before I intervene. That, that's not, we would have deserved that, but that's not who he is. He is gracious to us despite what he deserved. He was gracious to the Israelites despite what they deserved. There's no evening the scale, right? We cannot earn God's action. He is already intervening for us. This response from God in 1 Samuel 12 is meant to show us who our God is. It doesn't give us, he doesn't give us what we deserve. His grace is more powerful for those who have given him their life. As we look back 
uh, on what we covered so far, I want to give you guys a diagram um, to kind of make sense of it in, in a different way. Um, and I'll explain this, but this uh, diagram is called the growing cross. And so at whatever point that I um, understood who God was and who I am, I had some understanding that he was m perfect and I was not, right? You take that example of pride. I knew who God was, but I was still prideful, right? But as I matured, I saw, man, maybe God wants control of these parts of my life. And I understood my, uh, my awareness of sin grew a little bit more, right? But as my awareness of sin grew, inherently also the standard of perfection also increased, right? If I understand there's a new way that I'm not measuring up to perfection, I also see perfection as more perfect, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and this happens all the time. There's, there are things that I can think of where maybe six months ago or, or a year ago or even longer, uh, where I would have thought, yeah, that's okay. Um, but now I can see, man, maybe those things are breaking God's heart when I do them or when I think them or when I say them. And so <laughs> our Christian life is, is becoming increasingly more aware of how sinful and how short I fall and how perfect God is and then seeing the beauty of the gospel is that the cross covers the whole thing. The cross covers the whole thing. And, and as I grow in my relationship with the Lord, I see truly how much it covers. Right? Uh, the Israelites were on this downward trajectory of becoming more aware of their sin. And I am on this downward trajectory of becoming more aware of how sinful and wicked and broken I am. And the cross covers it. And that is, that is beautiful. The cross covers how sinful I am. Okay, if you remember, at the very beginning, we set out to answer the question, when I'm made aware of this rebellion, of, of this unfaithfulness, of, of the things that I do when I just go on autopilot, how do I come back? How do I come back? I want to leave you with, with two simple but, but deep applications uh, we see from the passage. Return and remember. What we see from the text is that sometimes when we're made aware of our wandering, um, our distance from God, the first and best thing to do is simply return to him. And as we've seen, the Lord desires for us to return to him. We have proof from the Israelites and time and time again in the Bible that God is a God we can return to despite what we've done despite what we continue to do, despite how far we've gone, how long we've gone without <laughs> turning to him. So let me ask you this question. Has there been something in your life recently, uh, like the thunderstorm in chapter 12 or, or getting peed on like me, has there been something in your life that is calling you back to the Lord, calling you to return? And maybe not, and that, that's okay. But if there has been, don't miss it, right? Don't just see it as something that happened. See it as a call to return to a father who loves you. And let me say this too. We can't return to somewhere that we've never been. We can't return to somewhere we've never been. And so maybe you're hearing this sermon and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I've ever sat at the feet of the Lord and given him my life. And I think that that is a very good and right place to start, right? Others, others of us, it might look like, um, returning might look like cutting something out of our lives that is keeping God at a distance. Or returning might look like going to him in prayer um, and giving him our anxieties, the things that we were trying to control that we weren't meant to control, right? And giving those things to the Lord and <laughs> to work out for his glory. So whatever it looks like for you, I hope that you can return to the Lord um, in a deeper way. The other thing I would challenge you with is, is remember. Remember who God is, All right? You can see in the passage, it says, consider the things I've done for you. Remember. If I think about that growing cross diagram, um, I am so prone to flatten one of those slopes, right? I am prone to think that I am not that sinful, uh, I'm not that far from who God is, or I'm prone to think that, man, God is not that powerful. 
He's not powerful enough to, to pull me out of that. And the battle is to remember that those things are both true. And yet, we just cannot, it is so hard to remember, right? Let me just say this. If you hear nothing else from this point, I am not powerful enough to make myself remember those things. I cannot, I cannot will it out of me. I cannot force it out of me. I, 100% of the time, it's, it's just never going to happen. That is why being in the word and being surrounded by mature believers is so important, right? I am not capable of willing myself to remember those things. But when I'm in the word, the word is telling me, this is who God is. This is who he is, and this is what he wants for you. And, and when I'm with mature believers, they remind me, man, your life, it's not what you think it is. It is the Lord has a plan and a purpose, and, and we can just get caught in these cycles and th- these thought patterns, and it takes an outside perspective to help us remember, man, who is our God, and what, is he do- what has he done for us? First Samuel 12 is all about the Israelites becoming aware of their unfaithfulness to God and God's faithfulness to them in his response despite their rebellion. It takes an earth-shaking event to make the Israelites aware of how they've wandered. But God meets them there and reminds them of who he is despite who they are. God calls us out of our wandering and searching for life apart from him and he calls us into life with him. Here's what I want you guys walking away with. We are all prone to wander. Every single one of us. And the reality is, that's who we are. But God has intervened. He intervened for us with his death on the cross, and he is currently intervening in every single one of our lives, calling us into life and life abundant with him. He has given us tools to remember who he is and to return to him. And the battle in our daily life is learning to continually do those things. Let me pray. Lord, you are so gracious to us. You have, God, you've revealed to us who you are, what your design is for for us and, and how we can just approach you and draw near to you despite how prone we are to wander, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, we would remember who you are and that life with you is a life that satisfies just the innermost longings of our soul, Lord. I pray that we would return to you and that we would remember how you've shown up in our life and how you will continue to for your glory. We love you. Amen.